Good morning, everyone. As everyone just starts to get settled in here, we will get ourselves underway. So again, good morning, happy Thursday. My name is Taryn Sebula, and I'm the Senior Manager of Member and Partner Success here at the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Thank you for joining us this morning for our valued member Grid Beyond's workshop on energy in transition, accelerating the path to net zero. This webinar will explore future energy trends as our esteemed speakers delve into the 2024 landscape marked by uncertainty, geopolitical tensions, and the urgent need for emissions reductions, and discover ways to go beyond targets and trajectories to aim for a truly sustainable net zero future. Speaking of esteemed speakers, we're being treated this morning by thought leaders Kareem Nakla, Business Development Director at Grid Beyond, and Robert Koblinski, Regional Storage Director at Grid Beyond. To give a little bit of a background before we begin on our esteemed speakers, Kareem Nakla brings a decade of expertise to the energy sector, specializing in industrial and commercial sectors. With a background in engineering from Texas A&M University, he honed his skills at Schneider Electric excelling in product management, business development, and strategy. Now a key contributor at Grid Beyond, Kareem's concise yet robust experience underscores his skillfulness in navigating the intricacies of the dynamic energy landscape. Our second speaker, Robert Koblinski, started as a renewable energy developer over 20 years ago, first in Canada, then the U.S., and eventually working on large-scale solar projects in West Africa. 10 years ago, Robert transitioned to working with large-scale CNI customers to manage and reduce electricity costs with the help of on-site battery energy storage. Now with Grid Beyond, Robert helps implement batteries and renewable energy resources for CNI customers in North America to meet their energy and sustainability goals. Now, before I pass the mic over to Kareem and Rob, I'd like to acknowledge this land on which we are meeting is home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Though you could be joining us or watching from anywhere, the board's offices are located on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. They share with us a sense of responsibility for intergenerational equity, the well-being of today and tomorrow. And now, without further ado, I'll pass the baton over to our speakers to kick things off. Thank you very much, Taryn. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. And a special thank you to the Toronto Region Board of Trade for hosting us. During this session, we'll dive into important topics and insights that can help us understand and navigate the changing energy sector. Before we jump in, uh, I'd like to provide a brief introduction on who we are and specifically who Grid Beyond is. Grid Beyond focuses on transforming energy into opportunity for uh, all types of energy consumers. Uh, we're currently at 160 plus team members uh, and a global company across the US, Europe, Japan, Canada, and Australia. We were founded in 2010 as a metering and monitoring company, grew into providing flexibility services uh, to various uh, uh, loads within the consumer side of the market. And uh, we currently hold 2.3 gigawatts of load under in our portfolio and 500 plus megawatts of batteries under contract. Uh, we also currently serve over 900 customers across uh, the globe. Now, uh, many of our large consumers utilize our software and services to maximize their energy opportunity some names you might recognize, such as Vale, Veolia, ESB, EDF, CRH, and uh, we primarily support them with energy procurement and trading, asset and production optimization and efficiency, path to net zero, and really our purpose is integrating energy and resources into your daily decisions and making sure that you do make the most of your energy. Now with that, uh, the aim of today's webinar, there are a few key points that I'd like to highlight. Uh, first of all, climate change and net zero have been on the policy agenda for a long time. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2018 emphasized the immen immense challenge of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which we're all aware of. 
Something also worth mentioning is in 2023, uh, we've reached record temperatures, which has exasperated this challenge. Targets so far are insufficient. Uh, time is short. Existing goals are inadequate. Um, so time for action is dwindling. In uh, the UAE, uh, during COP28, uh, there's a clear call for transitioning from fossil fuels. Now, the issue there is that we're only transitioning and we're not necessarily outright phasing out. Um, something also worth mentioning is that renewables aren't uh, the only solution. Uh, we see a growth in electrification across industries, vehicles, um, all shifting to more uh, sustainable resources. Uh, batteries are vital to our ecosystem as well. Um, we realize that uh, b batteries provide uh, balancing services to the grid, um, as well as uh, making sure that we increase our resiliency in the grid as well. Uh, we've noticed the market backlog as well across multiple grids globally. Uh, grid operators face a lot of challenges, uh, specifically with interconnections and making sure that they service all customers uh, in a timely manner. Now, net zero pledges now cover almost 90% of uh, the GDP and uh, over 88% of global emissions. But as we all know, setting targets is the first step. Many forward-thinking businesses are already taking action. Um, and uh, if you're not, there are various ways to do so. Uh, you can consider renewables, so shift to renewable energy sources. You can consider optimization, uh, improving your energy efficiency and your processes. Green energy procurement, so procuring renewable energy and supporting renewable de development in your region. EV transitions, so adopting electric vehicles, cutting out scope one emissions and last but not least you can't really know where you're going without measuring where you are today so carbon tracking is crucial to understanding where you are today reporting your progress and uh, effectively managing your carbon emissions now since 2018 the ipcc emphasized the 1.5 degree challenge um, but we're still seeing record-breaking temperatures globally uh, the sixth assessment report confirmed that our activities on Earth um, are causing even more global, global warming, surpassing the 1.5 degree above pre-industrial temperatures. There are clearly persistent concerns about the rising emissions, and uh, we need to do something about our consumption pat patterns. So if, uh, if everyone, um, you know, uh, had uh, a sense of feeling that they were a little too warm or it was a little too hot, depending on where you are in the world in 2023. Uh, that's primarily because we saw record breaking temperatures in 2023. June to August were some of the hottest months uh, last year, um, over 174 years. So for, for, you know, the last couple of years, the 2023 uh, year has set the highest record. Now, some of the takeaways from COP28 in the UAE, uh, the global stock take uh, draft informs future climate action plans under the Paris Agreement. National uh, nations will submit their uh, national, nationally determined contributions by 2025. Uh, renewable efficiency, uh, renewables and efficiency pledge. So 118 countries, including Canada, Australia, the US, have committed to tripling their renewables by 2030, uh, roughly up to 11 terawatts. Uh, many countries, 80 specifically, are phasing out fossil fuels, and we're seeing a historic transition as we speak. Um, there are approved deals on the December 13th, uh, pushing nations to transition away from fossil fuels. And in the UAE, there was consensus uh, which aims for net zero by 2050, emphasizing equitable energy systems transition. So there is really a strong urge in tripling the global renewable energy capacity by 2030 and the adoption of clean technologies like carbon capture and storage. Now, targets are great, um, but it's clear that there hasn't been sufficient action. Uh, the Climate Action Tracker, which you see on the right, 
in September that no no country is really progressing um, as fast as we need to. The pace and scale of what's been done so far and the current plans are insufficient to tackle climate change. There are multiple feasible and effective options that are available today for those who are willing to take actions. There's clean energy to utilize. There's uh, nuclear refurbishments uh, locally that we're seeing. There is grid modernization that's happening. And uh, all of this needs to happen with integrated long-term energy planning. Now, that doesn't come without uh, being inclusive of all the communities and organizations and um, industrial loads and commercial loads that need to be involved in this transition. So everyone really has a part to play. Um, and we're starting to see that uh, in Ontario as uh, policy is starting to support our shift to renewables or uh, add more renewables to our grid. Uh, so with that, I'd like to hand over to Robert to talk more about what's happening in Ontario. Thanks, Kareem. Um, do you want to move to... Uh, uh, okay, so um, we can talk about uh, Canada as a whole, but Ontario uh, in particular is moving towards uh, or trying to move towards a net zero target by 2050. Everybody who lives in Ontario has this assumption that, you know, most of our energy either comes from uh, nuclear generation or uh, hydroelectricity, hence the name in Ontario. When we refer to electricity in Ontario, we always refer to it as hydro. So everybody makes the assumption that our all of our electricity comes from hydroelectricity, which, you know, in, until recently has, has been the case. Um, that trend is, is changing. Uh, we have some nuclear facilities that are uh, being retired relatively soon. And um, due to climate change and other uh, effects, uh, hydroelectricity doesn't have the same capacity that it once did in the province. And so the province itself is having to rely more and more on uh, fossil fuels and carbon emitting resources in order to get the energy required to uh, meet the needs of the uh, Ontario consumer. Green. So uh, demand is projected to increase across the province by 1.9 or almost 2% for the next uh, 20 years. That's an annual forecast. A lot of that is being driven by um, population growth. Uh, electric vehicle uh, is, is a big driver in that. And then the last one is industrial sector electrification. A lot of the industrial se uh, sector electrification that you, you know might not know about is transitioning um, from things like uh, traditional uh, steel manufacturing using natural gas and, and coal to produce to electric arc furnaces. That's a, that's a big um, uh, industry that's moving towards electrification, as well as a homeowner is moving from natural gas heating to heat pumps and, uh, and heating through electrification. So that's a big driver. Uh, across the province, and we're projected to see, you know, a 25% increase over the next uh, decade and a half. So considerable amount of energy is increasing consumption across the province with less renewables or, um, or non-carbon emitting resources being available online. What has uh, just happened or occurred or is, is in the process of occurring is you have a lot of new industrial uh, customers moving into the province, new battery plants that are projected to use, you know, I think the province projection is the three new battery plants are going to be consuming over five terawatt hours annually. So that's a considerable increase in consumption across the province. These facilities um, want to be able to uh, purchase energy from renewable uh, energy resources and help increase the, uh, the amount of renewables on the system. Up until now, uh, unfortunately, they, they could do this, but uh, Ontario did not have a policy that allowed them to offset their entire commodity cost by entering into these types of agreements. These customers pay a, have a two, um, uh, uh, two parts of their commodity cost. They pay a, a market price and they pay a what's called a global adjustment price. And until recently, if they enter into these types of agreements with uh, renewable energy resources, 
they, they could only offset costs on their commodity price and not their global adjustment price. Because of uh, pressure to the um, Ontario government, they are now allowed or will be allowed to enter into these types of agreements, uh, which is a, a, an amendment to the regulation 42904, so that they will be able to offset both their global adjustment charges and their HOEP or market rates. There's also by the federal government, uh, um, an investment tax credit that has been approved uh, and budgeted for last year, encouraging investment in uh, renewables. So this is seeing customers seeing a 30% tax credit on their um, on their tax bills that will allow the uh, adopt, increased adoption of renewables. And then the Ontario government and the IESO have a procurement going on and uh, to increase the capacity and energy, mostly capacity across the province, which will allow for hybrid storage and renewable generation in the next coming uh, auction. So some of the trends in the province in terms of energy pricing, so um, I'm sure a lot of people are aware, Pickering Generating Facility is coming to the end of its lifespan. It's expected to be shut down by 2026. That's a three megawatt generating facility. So that's a large percentage of the baseload generation across the province. What happens when you shut down that amount of baseload generation is you end up with more natural gas being produced on uh, more often across the province. Natural gas comes at a higher price to the ratepayer or the consumer of, ele of electricity, and that will have an, an impact on increasing market prices. There's also an ongoing refurbishment of Bruce and Darlington. Uh, that's not that's not expected to reach completion until 2033. Again, that will have the same impact as uh, the Pickering Generating Facility uh, shutting down. So again, another reason why energy prices or market prices are going to start increasing across the province. On the flip side, we have new contracts coming in place to fill the capacity gaps. Those systems will be online by 2027. Those are not paid for through market rates in, in the province. Those are paid through primarily through global adjustment. And so then we'll see an increase on the global adjustment. So now we're seeing both market price increase and global adjustment price increase. And so that's an overall increase in the commodity price. And then again, Pickering refurbishment scheduled to commence by 2035, which will have an impact on global adjustment because that's all that will be all under contracted pricing, which will increase that global adjustment price uh, from 2035 on. And so what we're seeing is an, an expectation of the market price. So what's called the on, hourly Ontario energy price tripling over the next three years, while the global adjustment price is, uh, is which we call a catch-all, is set it to stay level or increase as well. And so we're going to see a considerable increase in the cost of energy across the province. And as mentioned, uh, with the ongoing refurbishment of Bruce and Darlington and Pickering coming offline, that's six thousand megawatts of non-emitting capacity that will come offline in Ontario over the next couple of years or three years. And so that gap in energy and baseload generation will be filled in by natural gas primarily. So those are peaker plants. Um, that will increase the emissions across the province. Ontario last year was 6% carbon emitting re uh, carbon emitting in terms of its supply mix. By the next three years, we're looking at 20%. So we're going from 6% supply mix carbon emitting to 20% carbon, carbon emitting. So considerable increase. So uh, as mentioned before, there, there's a rule change that is coming about in the next, I'm gonna say 60 days that will allow customers, CNI customers primarily, to enter into what are referred to as virtual PPAs or PPAs with renewable energy resources across the province, where they can have direct agreements with these uh, generating facilities. Those generating facilities will then sell energy into the market, will be increase the penetration of renewables across the province, hopefully filling some of the gap left by the nuclear facilities coming offline. Those, those same customers, will also be able to use that commodity and the energy generated during their coincident peaks. So these are class A customers that use a lot of electricity to reduce their global adjustment charges as well. So 
there's now a financial reason for customers to want to enter into these types of agreements. The eligible technologies will include wind, solar, small hydroelectricity, and potentially batteries that are co-located on wind or solar sites. For a lot of these customers, they are looking at the balance between the price that they have to buy the energy from on these sites versus the market price. It seems like uh, when you factor in the uh, tax credits that are available and the implementation of this new regulation, um, there is a lot of financial viability to customers entering into these types of agreements. So shifting perspectives um, are, are occurring as uh, we take a look at the market. Uh, a recent research, we found that over 30% of respondents see energy flexibility and renewables as a top trend uh, in future energy markets. Uh, with flexible technology, it's nearly being se pushing seventy-five, uh, pushing to up to seventy-five of respondents when combined with battery and EV adoption. So we're seeing a shift in perception in terms of the enabling technologies that reduce uh, our emissions and help us achieve our net zero goals. And we're also seeing policy support. So global policy, local policy, is starting to fall in place um, to help with the regulatory changes that are needed for the grid operators and uh, the consumer side uh, to start making this shift and transition towards a uh, more net zero future. Now, there, there are a few opportunities and challenges that uh, we help many to solve, um, reducing uh, your overall cost, uh, enhancing your sustainability, enabling resilience, reducing grid constraints, um, and on the top, you can see your, your journey from going from optimizing flexibility to your path to net zero. Uh, so some of, uh, some of the parts along the journey or some of the stages along the journey could help um, accelerate your journey and provide um, you know, financial means by generating revenue or savings and grid services uh, for customers to be able to accelerate their journey to net zero. Um, so that every customer has their own, uh, or every, uh, you know, energy consumer has their own unique situation. So there is no, you know, one size fits all. It's really a bespoke solution for each, um, and really depending on your challenges. So, uh, these are things that, uh, we've been able to help customers globally with, um, to make sure that they really make the most of their energy, um, just a, a brief example of uh, some of the ways that we're able to assist with in Ontario. So if we look at a large industrial uh, customer uh, with a site load of 14 megawatts, uh, let's make the assumption that they have a flexible load of seven megawatts, flexible meaning that that, that load is dynamic, can be turned up or down uh, as needed. Inflexible load meaning, you know, that's a load that we, we can't really shut off uh, you can almost assume like uh, if you are in your condo and uh, you wouldn't want to switch the AC off when it's too hot or the heating off when it's too cold. Uh, so these are things that might be inflexible, but there may be opportunities for tweaks here and there uh, to provide the flexibility that's needed to support the grid when needed. Uh, so for a flexible load, you may look at uh, using forecasters, peak predictors, to optimize your consumption and make sure that you're not consuming energy during peak prices. Uh, for inflexible load, as Robert was just mentioning, uh, you can look at entering into a virtual power purchase agreement to reduce your overall uh, cost of energy. Uh, and then with uh, demand response, uh, or in Ontario, as we call it, the capacity market, there are opportunities to increase uh, your uh, capacity contribution by even more granular asset control uh, and by using the power of AI with virtual power plants. So you'll see there are various value stacks on the right, um, and those are custom depending on your, your own situation. Uh, so these are things that, uh, that we can help with and explore together. 
Now, this is a dashboard that uh, we enable our customers to help um, track and monitor their energy consumption, their carbon emissions, uh, to be able to decide, okay, what projects should I put in place to take the steps that are needed to reduce my overall emissions. We also have real-time quantitative analysis uh, of the site's consumption. Uh, we can go down to the asset level, depending on how much metering or sub-metering is available. Um, you can track your revenues uh, or savings from the grid um, and the various incentives that are available to you. You can tr troubleshoot, see, okay, where where might we have uh, some inefficiencies within our process and how can we improve uh, to make for a more streamlined process or a more dynamic process. Um, so on the bottom left are some of the, the customers that we've worked with globally, some that use our AI-based forecasters, some that we help uh, monetize their flexibility within the market, some that we've helped enter into corporate or virtual power purchase agreements for them to also gain renewable energy credits or uh, energy attributes, renewable energy attributes. Uh, so in, in, in essence, this is really a, a balancing act um, and uh, it requires everyone's support. Uh, everyone really has a part to play uh, in the energy transition. Uh, whether you're a load or whether you're a generator or whether you're the grid operator or the regulator or the, the one setting the policy. Uh, it's quite important for all to play together collaborat collaboratively and uh, to ensure that uh, our grid is getting the best support that it's need for everyone to be able to um, you know, enjoy the benefits of it. Uh, this is a high level summary of uh, everything that we do provide at Grid Beyond. Um, demand side response or capacity, um, bid optimization and trading within the markets, uh, forecasting services, peak management, uh, a designer tool that could help evaluate um, whether you should be investing in solar, on-site solar or a battery or renewables in general, uh, and a baseliner tool to help you understand where you are today and where you need to go. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today uh, while we explored the intricacies of the global and local energy trends. Uh, from renewable energy revolutions to policy shifts, we've gained a lot of valuable insights into some of the forces that are shaping our energy future locally and globally. Uh, so I, I hope we can all carry this knowledge forward into driving a more sustainable future and everyone playing their part. Uh, because together we can really build a brighter future and cleaner energy ecosystem for many generations to come. And with that, we'd like to open up for any questions uh, the audience may have for Rob and I. Thanks, Kareem and Robert. I'm going to jump in and say on behalf of the Toronto Region Board of Trade, we're so grateful to Grid Beyond to have delivered that very insightful session to our member community and beyond. As Kareem mentioned, the floor is open for any questions. Feel free to drop any of your questions, comments in the chat, uh, or raise your hand, and we'll be sure to answer your questions in the order in which they appear or arrive. I did notice a, a couple of messages being sent from some of the audience members that super pleased in terms of the content that was presented. So again, once again, thank you to Robert and Kareem. Um, and any final remarks from Robert, Kareem that you'd like to deliver as we wait for some questions to appear? I, I'd say if, if anyone's too shy to ask any questions in a, in a public <laughs> forum, you can feel free to reach out to us individually. Uh, we'd be more than glad to hop on a call and have a chat. Um, Okay, we, we do have a question that's just come in, Taryn. Yes, what is the cost in Ontario per kilowatt for a residential solar install compared to utility scale kilowatt? Uh, I can answer that question. Um, generally, anywhere between two and a half and three times more expensive to install on a residential property than what a large scale commercial uh, project would be. So. Commercial projects are tending towards a dollar to a dollar twenty-five per watt installed, and residential is somewhere in the range of three to three and a half dollars per watt. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Mark. If anyone else would like to pop any more questions into the chat, feel free. Also, we encourage anyone who wants to pop themselves off of mute and to ask any questions, we welcome those as well. All right, and as we wait for maybe some final questions to come in, Kareem and, and Robert, if you'd like to add your email addresses into the chat, so if any guests would like to reach out directly, they'll know where to find you. Uh, in the meantime, I see Mark has raised his hand. Mark, the floor is yours. Yeah, so just to follow up to that question on the residential versus utilities cost, uh, the, the total the total demand for electricity is the is the same regardless of whether you do it on on, on your own roof or from a utility. Um, so it strikes me from a policy policy perspective, it's much more cost effective to to build out solar um, at a utility scale than at the at the uh, individual homeowner scale. Now, obviously, for the homeowner, there, there may be other benefits such as you know you feel you're contributing to a reduction of your own greenhouse gas emissions, but um, in the larger picture, it strikes me that the utility investment is the better investment to make, aside from the fact that it eats up a lot of land. Yeah, and and to the last point that you mentioned, the land part, um, there are a lot of regulations in, in Ontario and now Alberta that restrict the usage of, of certain types of land for the purposes of, you know, say solar facilities, uh, wind's a little different. And so, you, you know, there is a, a tier four lands and you cannot be putting solar on what would be prime agricultural land. So that's that's that part. To your point, it really, it's it's a commercial thing. So Ontario, 100% of the energy generated in the province of Ontario today is contracted for with the uh, system operator. And so it's always this balance with the system operator. They don't want to contract for energy. They would prefer people just build it and you know make money or not make money depending on the market price. And so there's this push and pull right now going on between you know facilitating you know companies to or, or industries to go out and build these sites and and not have to rely on the government to contract for that energy and have the energy costs uh, aligned with the actual cost or the demand at any given time. So there's this balance going on that makes it somewhat difficult for um, indust industries and uh, solar developers to go and build solar in Ontario. Thanks for that. I noticed Kareem had added his email address into the chat. Uh, I know Rob will, is, will do the same. So if anyone has any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to our esteemed speakers from today, Rob and, and Kareem, for any follow-up commentary, questions, inquiries. Um, otherwise, as we wait for some final questions to pop into the chat, I just want to say thank you once again to Grid Beyond and thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, and we look forward to catching you at one of our future events, whether it be another virtual member workshop, an in-person workshop, or any of the anchored TR Bot events. Feel free to, to visit bot.com and check out our events calendar to see the next event that we'll be lucky to welcome you to. Thank you, Shauna. I see a comment there, very insightful and educational workshop. Thank you. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. If anyone would like to reach out with some questions, by all means, feel free to reach out to us or to Rob or Kareem directly. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks a lot, Tara.